To know who we are, where we are, and where we're going, we must know how we arrived here. Welcome to Rephetic, a revolutionary study of the Great Pyramid, which promises to rewrite civilization's history. Jeremy. Hi. Welcome to Rephetic Podcast. I, you know, I like this take better. <laughs> already. Oh, I was great. already starting off bad. This yeah. is perfect. Good. Good. So... Uh, thanks for joining us with us today, Jeremy thanks Nulick. Hi. F- futurist extraordinaire. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Tell me what the hell that is. I don't Futurism? even know. Futurism? Well, you know, I think that uh, for a long time, and this is how it relates, I think this is why we connect even on the things that matter to you uh, to a degree. There's some, there's some consilience. You know, there's like uh, some alignment because it's like... Um, for some years now, maybe even after, let's say something even like the development of the of the clock or something like that, we've had this metaphor for how we understand each other, how we understand what we're doing in the world, what our place in it is, and a lot of it relates to what you we could call like machine metaphor, like this thing, these components work together and produce this result. Mm-hmm. Systems thinking, all this stuff. You see it animated in our language and the way we work and everything, you know? I mean, literally, it is called like clockwork, you know? And right. we don't mean precisely like a clock, but we all know what we mean when we say it. Right. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, in large part, that was animated by a desire t- to help us to be more effective to navigate a world that's really complex and difficult. I mean... Uh, you know, uh, a human's greatest sort of challenge most of the time is like, who am I and what am I supposed to be doing here? Right. (laughs) And, uh, and so like, happens to be the theme of my work. (laughs) Maybe. Yeah, it's a little bit. Right. That's what I was saying. So like, there's these answers that are provided through, through the mechanical thinking, right. That's like your job to be a human is to be a human. And it's this infinite regression of just like, just be more effective, more effective at whatever it is. Here's how you can be a better dad, how you can be a better whatever, how you can be a better CEO, how you can run your organization perfectly, all of these best practices off the shelf kind of things. Right. We Um, just plug right into that. Yeah. And the API is right there because it's like what we're hungry for. You know, it's almost like just satisfying on so many levels because it's like, well, here's the answers. You do this. Well, when that stops working, you replace it with this component part. Um, and, And I think, you know, I don't have any basis for this that I've done any kind of data analysis on this, but like, I think we're at a point where the, the best possible, I mean, and I should say like that kind of thinking has led to all kinds of wonderful shit. Like we've got, we've got air conditioning. We have really good stuff that would otherwise really suck, you know? Right. Um, heated socks, shit like that. Yeah. Like really what we have pet rocks. We've had, uh, we've had, beautiful wonderful things that have come right. out of but this. solar panels yeah aerospace engineering right, you right. Name it. i was throw this in there for for the mechanical people out there yeah somewhere along the line i did went down a little rabbit hole like rpms like they make a little uh like a helium injected spindle okay that does like a million revolutions per minute okay we, we think RPMs, right. it's like, we're pushing seven, 8,000, right. a million right. a minute. Right. Like, that's crazy. Mm. Mm. And here's what I'd say. A, a chief, what you brought up is perfect because it's like a chief thing about that is, why did we do that? Well, first of all, we don't know. And secondly, <laughs> the best answer is because we could. Right. Um, and so the only reason the machine does anything is because it can't. Yeah. But if you're going to ask it what its animating purpose is, it doesn't know what that is. Right. Um, if you're going to ask it, to what end are you trying to do this? Right. On a company scale, on a any scale, regional, you take it. any scale. Yeah, you can move that resolution scale. up and down all right. you want. And the only thing a machine's going to come back with is this is what I because do. Because this is what I do. Yeah. And um, I'm going to do it more effectively. That's so embarrassing. Right? And so, <laughs> it's, it's so ridiculous. <laughs> well, and on a human level, on, yeah. our, on our little ecosystems of friends and communities or families or whatever, it's like we're just so just that's the direction we're going. Well, we even balance it. I mean, it, it starts to you're right. I mean, we start to um, it infects the way that we even have friendships, you know, like you categorize and you have this taxonomy of the kinds of friends you have and how good of a friend you are. And you can replace out this friend with that one. The unfortunate thing here is of course 
we aren't actually dealing with machines. I mean, that's the part that's rough, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and, uh, and you only know that, though, if you pair back a little sure. with other people and go, hey, what are we doing here? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the people I know who embrace it the most, who embrace any kind of, other th any kind of thinking that's like, maybe there's, there's something. Well, and I should say, the, the signs to me that we're at a place where it's stopped working are all of the people who are suffering from like what I would call like pre-trans fallacy. Like, maybe if we just got back to being primitive. Maybe if we just got back to being hunter-gatherers. Yeah, yeah, Maybe if yeah. we just returned to the way we... Well, I mean, personally, I think that that's a beautiful idea. It's just la-la land because it's like we've let this out of the box now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. There's so only so many... The demonology associated with Like, you let this go. So, right. There's, so there's only yeah. so many regressions you can make right. in an evolutionary track, exactly. right? Exactly. And then, uh, so along the lines of what you were talking about... Uh, so, like, I've looked back, to not, again, not a deep dive, but, you know, the division of labor, mm. like, efficiency for efficiency's sake. Mm. And so on these arcs, over any significant period of time or significant level of complexity, you reach a point where what the efficiencies you engendered become inefficient. Right. And then it's like I'm driving to Kansas City to get a carrot right what what are we doing yeah so is that about some of what you're saying is like well we're we're at this a point where well i think that what it happens is at some point you you have to start asking why we're doing it and like i say the thing that's the most the most difficult in if you're operating out of that machine myth or that metaphor is there cannot be an answer other than because we need to be more efficient, right? So it will be this infinite. It's why, you know, it's like, a, it's that the kind of blues that you see that show up in the postmodernist, you know, it's like, why are we thinking this way? Because this is the way that we have to think, you know, it, there's just this uh, infinite regression. There's no purpose. There's no underlying meaning to the thing. It's, it can't, it can't provide that. Okay. And so the part of the rationale for using foresight or, if there's work I do as a futurist, it's because there is a need, I believe, for a canvas on which we can start to, it, to simulate what our real intentions are. What is that purpose? Mm -hmm. You know, to get something that uh, could synthesize where it is the machine is most useful uh, and have the machine serve an intention as opposed to, like, having our intention be in service of the machine. So you know, uh, that's really abstract, I suppose, but it's, it, you know, I think what it redounds to is what, uh, in what way, uh, could we rethink, recast, create possibility, uh, and use a canvas like the future because it's not threatening. It's not ensnared with what, you know, politics or circumstances are happening Entrapment right now and all that whatever, stuff. Yeah. And, you know, if you try to get somebody to think different, like if you just sit someone down and be like, okay, well, think about what's possible. Well, that is surrounded with just tripwires of, okay. of have, today. Oh, yeah. You just have like your body is immune almost to that stuff. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I don't even want to do that, you know, and why, you know. Right. Uh, but if I already say, well, let's just assume it's, you know, 20 year horizon and this is actually uh, the future in which you found yourself. How did you find yourself there? Right. You know, you can begin to have a useful conversation about what really matters. What okay. is the animating purpose? Well, let's, let's do that. Okay, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, so, and obviously, and Jeremy is the editor extraordinaire on my book project, which I, I think I mentioned that last video I hope as you well. Did. But the, uh, how did you get roped into that? <laughs> how did I get roped into being your editor? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're a curious enough person that I had to see what the fuck it was you were working oh, on. Oh, right. I right. mean, come on. I mean, it's like, uh, well, the first time I met you, I think I instantly disliked you. Uh, I think which is good for the listening audience. You're in good company. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, I, I think that you had offered, I, I was so, uh, I had such a low sense of like self-worth and everything that when you offered like, 
just some uh, some thoughts on some things that you didn't you disliked about what you were seeing. I just made the assumption you were talking about. Me. Oh right, you just in- you know? internalized. Yeah, I just internalized them. Like, well, obviously it's me. Right. You know, um, but it, you know, uh, I think that a couple of reasons why. One, like I say, is that you've just always been an interesting character to me, and that your uh, your sort of view of the world is something I've always been compelled to listen to no matter no matter what so there, there's that and you're my friend so there's that there's also just like uh i think you know in particular the the canvas you chose the inspiration you chose is so wrought with with this weird mire right because it's like on the one hand you've got people who are so convinced that this is the way that this happened right like these these pyramids are constructed in this way. This is exactly, we know how it happened. And then, th- so then the only other narratives that can, that can pertain in that kind of context are ones that are like aliens, you know, like uh, they have to be so far removed from any kind of rigor um, because there is so much, you know, weight or, you know, like a vortex of, of thinking here. You right. Know? And so when you said, I want to enter into this conversation, into this milieu, offer essentially what I think in Hegelian terms is more of a synthesis. Like it's more of a, yeah. it is neither what you always thought it was, nor does it have to be some yehu rigorous, like un, you know, unfounded you know, right. uh, uh, sort of thing. Uh, but there's a way. Uh, and actually, it, it works on a completely other dimension. You know, it's like we're we're talking about another dimension here. We're not even talking about the dimension that this is arguing over. Right. Um, yeah. 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 And that, uh, of course, just in even in any respects that that a lot of times can only happen with the, a unique perspective yeah. with a unique question or yeah. some new discovery or novel thing. Mm-hmm. And, and then, you know, as you mentioned that and people may be familiar with like the dialectic model, the dram- dramatic model. Right. You know, uh, thesis would be the orthodox body of interpretations, claims, et cetera, et cetera. Right. The antithesis in this case would be, and not just the zany, no, but people pushing back on the exact evidence right. as, as I'm going to do as well. Sure. Exact evidence. And then the interpretations and claims r- related to that evidence. Right. And then somewhere, you know, similar to the Cunian stuff, which we've talked about as well. Right. Um, and, and, and that's probably the first, big thing I'm going to present along the topical uh, presentations somewhere comes a synthesis that where it's in my, in my case, it's like almost everybody will be satisfied with with whatever that final solution seems to be. Right. Well, because I believe, I think your stance on it obviates like in the true sort of synthesis form, it obviates the original challenge. So it says that's actually not the problem we were solving. Right. Right. The problem we were solving was something else. Yeah. You know? um, and, and that to me is what I think is, you know, if there's something um, potentially transformative, I think, for, for people. Um, and like I say, part of this, too, that aligns with me is that, I mean, I, I like anything that does something that just, you know, rabbit hole someone or, you know, whatever. <laughs> right. Uh, into just like, for the journey? Maybe, or well, I mean, it? just like. So you mean there's a different way I could be thinking about this, you know, or I might change my mind about something or this could lead to, um, you know, there are, again, sorry to go on on about this machine thing, but like the other quality of machines is that they're generally heavily deterministic, you know, like there's a thing that they're after that they produce. And you see, again, the world is wrought with this. If you follow these five steps, your children will end up like this, you know, um, and again, the unfortunate thing is human systems are emergent. They're non-deterministic. They, uh, nature is non-deterministic. You right. know, it doesn't say here are the ingredients and it, it, that we do this output. And if, if you want to change the output, you change the system, change the system around, you change the output. Those things are true of machines. They're not true of you and me. They're not true of nature, you know? Right. Um, and so, you know, I think that uh, what it, anything that sends someone into a state of, so you mean there could be something more for me here, you know, or there could be another way that's non-deterministic. Like, 
I'm not saying you have to believe anything or believe a certain thing. Right. But I'm saying what you could do. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, to, to, well, I, I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but, but to the extent that people, let's say, they kind of get blindsided mm. by, you know, whatever revelatory right. thing that there is, um, I want to apologize <laughs> ahead of time because I don't know that everybody wants that or is ready for that or whatever the case might be. I mean, I do suspect people are mature. They can handle their own, you know, evolution of their psyche and sure. their history, et cetera, et cetera. But like you read an early draft, uh, were you quite prepared for what that was? I mean, no. Is the I mean, aside answer. from the fact that it sucked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have a style, that's for sure. I mean, I think that I, I think I understood in broad strokes the topic area. I don't think I fully understood uh, what I would say is the the user experience of walking through the journey. So, like, there is the overt content of the thing, and then there's the impact it has on you, right? right. And those those can sometimes get really close. Um, in particular, if it's a didactic piece piece of text, but that's not what you have. You know, I think that your thing is more like, here's an invitation. Um, here's an invitation toward a set of discoveries, you know? Uh, and this is a way that you could, you could, you can come along. You yeah. Know? And I didn't know that there was going to be something like that. I didn't know. Uh, I don't think I fully understood what, what, yeah, what you, maybe what you had designed. I guess I've never even asked you. Is that what you were designing? Do you mean the structure? I mean the, the experience of like, so if that, you know, so if we say that the basis of this is untrue, I guess here's the thing. I didn't connect anything about your, particularly your topic area or whatever it is, like the structure of these pyramids mm -hmm. and everything like that, to anything happening to me right now. Right. And it wasn't until I read the thing that I'm like, oh, I see. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if the core of this, if the foundations of that uh, weren't what we thought they were, then what does that mean? Yeah. And, yeah. Right. And like the time warp is, I mean, that, and that's even the big question. It's like, you know, people do in their own personal lives. It's like, well, my parents had this challenge or that challenge or we moved here. I switched schools or whatever. It's like, do you know the impact that had on you? Right. Not, not really. usually. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. 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 I mean, not until like there's like 20 years of therapy or something. And how and would you, yeah, yeah. how right. would you, so, how could so, you know? Right. Yeah. Exactly. And then it, it like mapped onto this machine, you know, beehives thing is, uh, you know, I think the tendency and certainly for myself at different periods of my life is just, you know, just robotic in that machine thing. And, you know, I just assume really that, like the story I got was this accurate story. And then again, I use the adoption analogy in, yeah. in my presentation as a useful tool anyway. It's like, well, what if the story that we're living by is not real? And yeah. what if I'm not- Mom and dad aren't mom and dad, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and what if, our, what if our Western culture mm. has a, a different origin? What if, you know, the, the origins of, conflict regional conflicts have a, maybe a different cause right um what, right. and and again broaden it out into the constructs it's like well the religious construct the political constructs um the social constructs you know i mean we throw around words like the patriarchy and this and that whatever but what if there's a root cause for a lot of it mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it's just like right i'm not sure who i am Right. As a result of this whole history. Right. And now that's interesting enough on a personal level. Right. Right. And obviously you got to deliver. Right. And the content and the, 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 you know, the, the craft or whatever, but it to, and we've talked about this incessantly is mm -hmm. what does that look like for 8 billion people? Right. And then there, and there is no way to know. There's no way to know. Right. Which is exactly like, yeah, that's the beauty part of it because it's not deterministic. It's right. like, well, this wasn't designed to have 
this particular outcome for a group of people. Right. Um, so I think what that means is it's, yeah, like it could have any number of outcomes, you know, um, 10 years, 14 years from now, uh, or whatever. That means that, yeah, the, the, you could see a lot of, I think, transmutations shifts in how we understand our systems, our role in them. What do they mean? Mm -hmm. Um, how could we be thinking differently? Yeah. And then too, doesn't this map on to like, you know, youth emancipation or things like that? Sure. Where we're, you know, out from, it's like we're, we're confronted with societal pressures, family pressures, gender pressures, whatever, whatever role pressures that the machine is asking us for. And then it's like, is, is that a really part of, is that a part of an identity that I want? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because like you see, I think that one of the possibilities that I was most excited about was like, um, there's this popular saying in the culture right now, like, don't, don't, don't yuck my yum. You've heard this. No, I no? think I might have. Yeah, probably. Um, but you know, uh, I think that usually it gets sort of cited when there's something that I'm exper well, when it's aimed at me, I could say it's when it is that I'm like, why are we doing this? Whatever thing, whatever it is, a gender reveal party or a thing, whatever. And I'm like, I don't understand the underlying purpose of this right. or Christmas you know? or, or whatever. Christmas. Yeah, or, yeah. Uh, yeah. Whatever. Um, uh, your fourth wedding ceremony. Um, like there's things like this that I'm like, I'm, uh, I don't know what, what is this about? Uh, and even in asking the question, you sort of get confronted with you're being uh, curmudgeon. You're being, you know, whatever, uh, in practice, in pra we're, right. pra we're still practicing. Right. Exactly. What was it? What were the two guys? The Muppets? Yeah. Waldorf, Waldorf and Stadler. And Stadler. Yeah, right. <laughs> I seen better yeah, legs I mean, on a stool. That's right. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> I seen better head uh, on a mug of beer. Yeah. So I mean, you, don't yuck my yum. Don't yuck my yum, you know, is what I, I you know, you hear it. And I, I believe, anyway, to cite that as a microcosm, uh, I don't mean to sort of make this too, I don't know, shallow of an insight. But I think that, like, uh, what's, it's, it's unfortunate that, and I've have friends of mine, like you're one of them. I have some other friends that they just sort of live by this example of, yeah, I mean, I know that everybody does that. I just don't really, that's, this looks like fuckery. I'm not, yeah, mm, I don't want to do that thing not for me. Uh, it's, you know, it's not my thing, you know, speaking of and, that, hmm. Sorry. So that's the uh, sovereignty autonomy thing is what I was pulling at. Oh, yeah, like, okay. So go, yeah. Go. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many. Well, I mean, again, I'm, I'm just baffled by the number of impositions. Yeah. I'm, I'm baffled by it. My wife is pregnant, right? Uh, for the second with time. Twins. With twins. Right. We're doing like, you know, four weeks, whatever. And like the amount of bullshit that we put on pregnant women on what they're supposed to do or not do that just seems completely unfounded by like anything. And there's certainly no data that supports it because you're like, no, come on. It's like, <laughs> like, it's, right? it's like, like whimsical Karen requests. Yeah, exactly. You know? Just like, well, you know, don't sit like this and only eat things that are cooked at this temperature. And only wear this. And whatever. And it's like... And when you got babies, no well, breastfeeding and in that's, public. Right, well, there's that. I mean, well, yeah, and you're bringing up the one out where I was just headed, which is like, oh man, like would have been cool like that's absent any of the, the social cultural pressures is the pressure that, that they're even put upon interper like with themselves. Oh, you know? right. I mean, just being in that situation and so much of it is just, it's just made up stuff, right? you know? And I'm like, that, that's not real, you know? Uh, but you know, I think that if there's any hope I have, it would be that if, if it's, if it's your book, if it's this podcast, if it's whatever, if it starts to help people to come to like a, a sense of, well, revealing the ways in which your past decisions created the cascade you're now experiencing. And that it, it's, it can be daunting and terrible to see at times because essentially that's like an inventory. Well, how did I get here? Well, I guess I made these choices. And in some ways that's hard to deal with. But on a macro scale, well, how did we get here? Well, socially or 
you know, there were forces at work that made certain choices that got us to this point. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about that is that means that you can make different choices now if right. you want a different, yeah. <laughs> you know, like you can begin to carve out your own possibility space. You can begin that sort of thing. You don't have to conform. Right. You know, reclamation. To, right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so even that fits within this broader sense of, um, you know, I think I'll address it in the last chapter, kind of a, you know, the risk and benefits, you know, like, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. Um, cause certainly there are risks, you know, there's risks to, you know, Neo's red pill. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. he's going to throw up and, yeah. and then you're going to tell them the whole thing's made up. Right. I mean, there's risk or right. the adoption analogy. Right. It's like, Hey, these right. are not your real parents. And, uh, Right. And they lied to you. Right. Here's your birth records. Now, what are you going to do? What are you going to do now? But right. it's not a, what are you going to do by yourself? Right. It's never that. Right. It's what are we going to do right. together? Right. And how do, and how do we do this? You know, so before we get too much further, I have to say, thank God my wife is pregnant. She's wonderful and beautiful. And, and everything. Absolutely. And I'm grateful for it. Yeah. So I didn't mean to say no, my well, wife is only this not. mindless yeah. victim. Of yeah. <laughs> we all are. In I mean, yeah. I mean, it's uh yeah. So there, yes, your wife is pregnant with twin girls, twin girls. That's good. I'd love hanging out with your son, Atticus. Atticus. Yeah. yeah. Good. He's a great stuff. dude. Very precocious young man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I think, as I was mentioning, the, the few other people, you know, like I'm having, have to coerce into talking to me, but we'll pr hopefully we can do a series of discussions. We do a round table. We just need more mics. But how many people though? Yeah, I don't know. I'm just, yeah, no, I'm, just, we're going to do I'm thinking that. like the machine. It's more efficient. You get more people in. I'm yeah. joking. Yeah, we are going to do that. I was thinking, uh, there, well, there's a couple people, guys at, uh, two brothers at an automotive shop. I want to have them in and talk to them. And then, um, another friends of ours and have, two guys in so i do have to get another set like now soon so what uh so other than the future stuff and other than being my friend and uh you know all this other stuff you have a literary background yeah. and you also have um, a, a running background tell us uh, tell us about the journalism well, stuff or media stuff sure i mean the reason you get into distance running is because you're just lousy at sports like I was terrible. Right. <laughs> uh, it was always like picked last, you mm -hmm. know, sort of guy. And I was a very round pink, uh, young man in, you know, elementary school, whatever. <laughs> so the only reason <laughs> that you get into, um, you know, like in the, the puberty struck much later than everyone else, all of those things combined was just like, yeah, yeah. We don't pick new look for anything. How about you be the goalie? Like, don't move. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's too, uh, fun. that's too funny. I, uh, I just, uh, I think that my, it was really my father. I, I grew up in a household where with two loving people who encouraged me a lot, you know? Um, and my father is a very disciplined person. I think he runs at the same time every single morning to this day. Uh, and I just kind of grew up watching that. And I think I just started thinking, well, I guess I'll try it or something like this. So uh, I did that and then started running in high school and then eventually just got serious about it and turned it into a competitive thing um, all through college. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I enjoyed going to college. I did probably more, I probably developed more as a result of the work I did with a cross country team than I did the schooling the school work all, I mean I I ended up finding my niche and, and really enjoying it and that's where I I was turned on to how do you express how can you articulate and express ideas that are otherwise like inarticulable like a challenge like that became really interesting to me and that's what drew me to to literature anyway or to you know writing um as a craft or something like this but yeah I mean the running thing taught me so much about like um it was like psychology by proxy, you know, sort of stuff because, uh, it is a mental game. It's an endurance game. Uh, it's more infinite than it is finite. And so, you know, it's, uh, it taught me experientially about, I think some 
precepts around psychology that maybe I didn't know that I was learning or something, um, but that have started to serve me uh, today. Can someone go through that same process walking? I think so. Okay. I mean, I think you can do it. There's still hope for me. You could do it kickboxing. You could do it, you know, doing needlepoint. I mean, I think you could, you could get through it with whatever it is. I think it just happened to be that that was where it played out for me. Um, and I wonder if like a design principle on that that's important is that you can't assume that it's going to do anything to service you cognitively, but then it suddenly does. And so be, like your defenses aren't up, you know? Mm, yeah. And so then you actually learn some shit because you weren't, uh, you weren't like screening, already screening. Yeah. For you it, weren't yeah. screening. <laughs> I wasn't weeding it out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like, Oh, that's not for me. You know? So, uh, my defenses were down. So I learned something, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I, I became interested in how people express themselves via communications, uh, just via whatever vehicle that is and, uh, got drawn into that and ended up getting a job in, in creative kind of work as a result of that, you know? So that's what set me on that, that path. Um, but I've, uh, worked and done freelance journalism, written stories. It's actually what the running made me curious about people and their motivation, you know, like right. running makes you curious about like, cause there's no good answer also. on like, well, why would you run an ultra marathon? There's, there's, there's no good answer. There's no satisfying <laughs> answer. I mean, because like any answer you could give, you could, you could serve that purpose with some other means uh, if you're just looking at the surface level. But if you want to get down to the real purpose on why you do something like that, it's usually because there's something that's unresolved. Like something in you and your identity is unresolved. Right. That's the only reason that you can really do that. Now, whatever that is for you, I don't know. But there's something that's just not quite right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So by this, though, are you saying <laughs> that the, the lazy people that would sit on the couch and not do anything, that they're somehow hmm. more peaceful, more serene, less conflict? Maybe. Just happy. and. <laughs> I don't know that many people that are like that. Stasis. I, uh, yeah, I don't know that many people that are like that. I right. imagine that, right. I mean, uh, I... Uh, I probably just have such an odd point of view because it's like even the people I surround myself with are just, yeah, they're like you. So there isn't a lot of like, you know, like I'm going to get a job and there's, look, there's nothing wrong with getting whatever job it is. I don't give a shit really. It's just like, you know, uh, I work at the post office. Do you want stamps? Okay. Here's more stamps. I go home at this time. I watch the same TV program. I do the whatever. Um, I just don't know man, that many people like yeah, that. Yeah, it was the remake of the uh, remake of the Hustler. Did you watch it with Mark Wahlberg? Was that the Mark Wahlberg scene yeah. where he's like, "There's a lot, he's like, yeah, of the, a really yeah. happy plumber." Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. there's a lot of plumbers in the world. Most of them are happy. That's right. Go do that. That's right. <laughs> but I, I see. I think where you were hinting, or maybe where you were leading, was like, could it be that sort of like an unresolved question or a challenge or something, and that's kind of what spurs. Something yeah. like, I don't know, writing a book or, uh, you know, like I said, like, you know, pursuing whatever that is. It's because there is something that is intention, you know, yeah. like there's something there to lean into to work out, you know. Um, most of the people I know are like that. They're usually like people who are curious about some kind of question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's well, I mean, I mention it as a curse and a blessing. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I guess it's both. Eh? Well, and like even your story uh, is, I think, a testimony to this because it was it was out of the, the sort of the, the, the soil was uh, sort of fertilized with everything. Right. It had. Um, uh, hey, well, and so this is funny. I love I should. You know, before I, it looks like I'm really kissing your ass. There's a part of the story that I like in particular because it redounds to something that I just enjoy. Was it the ATM part? No. Oh, whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, no, no. It's the, uh, it's the idea about like, what if you got everything that you wanted, right? And and so, I mean, the thing that's also beautiful, like as a, as someone who does work in foresight, one of my favorite things to do is to ask people if you could just have the world you want, what it would look like. And then what I do is I, I simulate that reality, mm -hmm. let's say, almost without fail. Every time I do that, and I'm like, it's 10 years out, 
here's everything you wanted. It is puppies, and there's rainbows, right. and there's clouds, and you don't have to work hard, and all this stuff is going on, and your organization's just killing it, and everybody's happy, all this stuff. And without, like, I, I play a narrative game to just say, okay, then what would happen? Okay, tell me what's next, you know, what's gonna happen, whatever, you know. People go right into collapse every single time. <laughs> like, every time, almost without fail, are like, oh, I got everything I wanted? Well, it's all gonna go to shit. No, here's how. Right. You know? um, so anyway, the part of the story that, your story I like is, I thought that I'd gotten everything I wanted, and of course, that wasn't really what I wanted. Yeah. You know, and you have to confront that, you know, at some point. And so, I mean, in as much as I think it's an important question, like the size of the question you're asking, it's also because like you were placed in some situation where you were reasonable enough to hear it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, th this is the reason to write the memoir. Right. Sure. <laughs> it's not, a, it's not, it's, it's, right. it's not a, 30 second clip obviously in anybody's life but, no. but uh i think it all i think for me it comes it came down to i had accepted a, a self-image that i had crafted and society had crafted and my parents and people and friends and girlfriends and whatever i had somehow accepted that and mm. then what i did was i started to massage it mm to a fine point. Right. And then I was captured by it. Right. And then obviously I, it, it ultimately it just became unfulfilling, which is the point. So whatever comes from me originates in me has to do with me right. is not going to be fulfilling. Well, take that one step further. And Todd did not want to talk about with this, but I told him <laughs> we're talking about it next time. I, I early on, I had it in one of these stories that, um, you know, I took this seeming, you know, the spiritual practice, this uh, seeming uh, lifestyle of service to others, whatever. And I flipped that into an egoic exercise. Right. Right. So what now? Right. I mean, at the emotional level, at the spiritual level, you know, if I, let's say, you know, a mother Teresa, whomever, it doesn't matter who it is, but you're going down, you're helping the kids at the orphanage, you're baking, you know, cookies in the ch church, you're doing the carpool or coaching the kids. I've seen this with coaches, oh, you man. sports coaches a lot too. Yeah. Right? Um, it's like, I, I can't give without it somehow imploding mm -hmm. in, in, in this yin and yang of the human condition. And so the, all this stuff kind of settled at the same time. Right. And I'm like, what the fuck? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's good that I was able to pause and listen, even in the midst of turmoil. You know, I'm separated from my sons. Uh, you know, all that. Yeah. Because it still be able to be serene, even, even as things collapse. Yeah. Health issues. It was everything. It was yeah. health. It was finance. It was career. It yeah, was any married, category. All of it. Right. Yeah, all of exactly. it. Exactly. At, at one time. Right. Not just a, not, I, you could just call it a midlife crisis. And this is the other thing I mentioned with my niece too, is like, you know, here I am, the 1% of the globe pounding on my high chair. Right. Well, my life didn't turn out great. Right. Didn't, you know? Not the way I wanted it to be. Yeah. Right. So part of, part of it is like the apathetic, like, yeah, get over yourself. The other part is time and place that can, that can be a great motivation for whatever else you want to do. Well, yeah, it's, I suppose one read is that it's like, in spite of the turmoil, I could be still and listen. And another read is because of the turmoil, I could finally sit still and listen. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, yeah. Uh, it's probably both. It's somehow both. It's yeah. always both. Yeah. <laughs> right. Cause it's somehow like, you know, um, the places where people usually feel the greatest distance from some kind of meaning is usually when it, it like that meaning didn't go away or that thing, right. whatever you were chasing. Yeah. It's the dark and the dawn and yeah, whatever. Yeah. All that shit. So sure. just take one more step and, don't, you know, don't leave right. yeah. five minutes before the miracle. Yeah, right. there's all those bromides about it, right? Now I get it. But the reason they exist is for real. Like, you know, if you're going through hell, keep going kind of stuff or whatever right. that shit is, you know. <laughs> and all of that stuff is true. Um, and it's one thing to, like, put it on, uh, you know, the back of your car. It's another thing to 
experience it and then be responsible for what insight you derive from it. You know? Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about creative responsibility. God, that sounds like fun. Well, no, it's just like, <laughs> I mean, who talks about that? I, you noticed I checked the time when yeah, you said that. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, we all, we see it in people's lives, but especially if you've got some drive, a real drive, sure. what are you going to do with it? Right. You're going to just let it die with you? Right. Yeah, I mean, not to get, I mean, there's a couple thoughts I have on it, of course, but like not to get weird about it or something but like I remember distinctly I was working on uh, a project um, it actually it was a it was a anthology of some of the creative work I'd done so far or whatever and I was just dragging my feet on it I just didn't want to do it um, mostly because I couldn't get it I couldn't get the artwork to a place I really wanted it never was matching the aspiration or whatever mm. and I had this uh this dream. I'm taking notes here, by the way. <laughs> no, I, know, I had this dream that there were these like uh, musicians in a library that I used to go to. Like I went into the library and there's all these musicians sitting there and they're taking chunks of paper out of their mouths. It's like, so they're just ripping like these pieces of paper and then they're all, they're putting them in a fire. <laughs> so they're just like, so I don't know what that meant exactly, but I woke up the next day and I just finished it. Cause I'm like, I, I guess the signal I took was, you know, uh, it would be to, to not archive what that is somewhere uh, is useless. And I guess, an, or, or, you know, it's just not, it is not being responsible to the inspiration you were given. And like what bigger question or what other question I, should, I suppose do we have as human beings who have enough consciousness to understand that we exist if it isn't like, why are we here and what are we doing? Like, and to me, that's the largest creative responsibility. If, if some creative work doesn't carry the, the load of like establishing some of that or peeling some of that back or asking you to look there, then what is it doing? You know? So anyway, sorry. Another read on that stupid, weird dream is like, Hey, don't make too much about what it is you're doing. <laughs> No, so it is both. You have a responsibility to get it done, and, um, you know, uh, you could set fire to it, and you're still, you're still useful. You know, you're still you. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so there was something there for me. I still haven't figured out that tension because usually when you try to make a decision about something that sounds so in, like has so much integrity, there's usually something in tension with it, like hey, you have a responsibility to get your creative work done and don't think so fucking much about yourself and your creative needs and your little voice and whatever. You are person whatever Yeah. now serving 8.9 billion in new creative insights. Right, you know, right. Like those are, the world is, has tons of that. You know, you are a voice or a part of it. Um, so it's, it's, it's both like a responsibility and a right sizing, I think in some ways. Yeah. And I think, uh, just in that at the, you know, at the end of that, it's like the right sizing part, you know, um, uh, I mean, you know, maybe other people and I'm surely going to find it out with this popular They're discussion. They're going to find out everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, just let it go too, you know, yeah. just let it go. Who cares, man? Right. Yeah. 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 The whole like perfect, the enemy of the good thing. Ah, uh, like, yes. Right. You know, just like, but just, yeah, we talked about how you can't go back when we were talking. The context was the machine thing. This is why it is. We can't go back to like hunter gatherer. Okay. Formulations of social understanding, whatever. And there, there's a degree of like demonology about this. We've let it out. It now has its thing that it wants. Oh, right? right. And I think creative work does that too. You know, it has its trajectory. Right. It has its thing. Right. Now, the degree to which you can listen, you know, enough and receive enough and receive effectively enough to just basically help it do what it wants. That's what you're doing, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, can you ultimately you can step back from the credit part of that that's exactly it because it's doing what it wants yeah yeah it's like um 
but yeah. responsibility and credit or blame or whatever. Right. It's the, that maps on to like the God thing too. Yeah. It's like, well, if you give him all the credit, well, where's he at on the blame part? Too? Yeah. He's got to be both. <laughs> That's right. It's That's like, right. if you want both, if you yeah. want one, you're getting the other too. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. well, all right. Well, that's good, because we want to skip that. <laughs> all right, we got another 10, 11 minutes. That's poor people. So what else do we talk about? Uh, you know, and let me apologize for torturing you also, just because I have felt You tortured. meaning me? Yeah. Oh. I'm not saying, I'm not overblowing it. <laughs> I'm just saying that I get so, like, this is my creative journey. Yeah. And people that watch too, it's like the whatever that whatever that madness part is, like it's it's pretty intense. <laughs> it's pretty intense. Yeah. And then, yeah. and then, but then too, if it's over an extended period of time, it's like, you know, how many times am I going to ask the same question? How many times am I going to talk to you about the same thing, whether it's structural so i'm working on the first chapter four and yeah uh, yeah i got you i know i mean no look uh i mean i you know me well enough to know i wouldn't do something out of a sense of like responsibility or duty to you you. if you wanted to stop you would say i would just tell you that i need to fucking do something else yeah (laughs) it's like i'm so terrible about my sense of responsibility Mm. (laughs) that when you that's why it is when you said the word i'm like because that feels like some mm. externalized thing. Yeah. And so it is only out of complete. I mean, dude, first of all, there's a few layers. One is I'm just entertained. I mean, it, it's fucking hilarious. I mean, this is fun for me. <laughs> I, you know, I get to I get to watch, you know, somebody go through this stuff over and over again or come to the same. You've, I think, come to the same conclusion multiple times just through different doors, you know, yeah. and it's because, you know, at, at least to some extent, what I like to tell myself is you're taking an elevator up or something. This is developing into something. And maybe you'll go up and down this elevator, but the next time you get on that floor, you're like, oh, yeah, that's right. This is this floor. I just, okay, all right, okay. You know, but you had to do it. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made sense, you know? <laughs> so, uh, first of all, it's just entertaining. Secondly, dude, I just, uh, I honor our friendship. Like, I like having you as a friend. I mean... And uh, I like someone who is crazy enough to go into this abstract land and, and, and be comfortable in the ambiguity, you know? So, dude, it's, it's not because you don't need to apologize. At any point, I would have been like, dear God. Yeah. No. <laughs> you know? But I think that's true of a lot of people. Yeah, and of course, too. Well, thank you for that. But uh, it's not done done. No. So... It's There'll be not, more. There, yeah, that too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, even, even like, I don't, you know, I don't go back and read my journals and this sure. and that, whatever. So, yeah, like, I'll be able to gain enough perspective on it at some point anyway, right? Sure. If I want to. Yeah. It's like, oh, this happened at this time and this and that. Yeah, that, assuming that. your meat suit makes it. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> I'll save that for the memoir. <laughs> or maybe we can talk about it, but... I mean, I, I've not, I have not, I have not met anybody that was like, Hey, I'm starting on this thing and I have serious issues <laughs> that, that I'm not going to, this needs to be done before I die. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's not a normal conversation for someone at 38 right. or right. 42 or right. 52. Right. It's like, Hey, I'm on this journey. And I'm really, really, this is like the worst present for my two sons is if I die before it's done. Yeah. So yeah. that's crazy. That, I mean, that's border to me, that's borderline. And I don't know who to talk to about that. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, especially not me. Cause it doesn't even sound that crazy. I mean, it just sounds, yeah. It's a function of the thing. It's obviously. inspired. Yeah. You know, and, uh, I mean, even even uh, again, as we, as we kind of start this discussion, even for, for other writers, other creative people or just, you know, casual audience, uh, curious people, you know, early on I, I did, uh, so I did the research for a couple of years, wrote, wrote an unpublished paper, did spend maybe a year on the modeling. Mm-hmm. And I was like, 
I don't know what to do with this. Well, I guess I'm going to outline this book proposal. Mm-hmm. And then I'll send that out and shop for agents, you know. Right. And then uh, one gal I was talking to, she helped me really rework my proposal. It was super helpful. Um, but she, and she didn't sign me right away. Like she had, a, she had a publisher that she thought she was going to place the, that she had an opportunity to place the book with. Uh, but she didn't end up signing me. But then even after that, I went on to query different publishers and I s- submitted to a couple. But what I discovered, you know, p- particularly for this lesson, and, and especially maybe, maybe other people could benefit from this too, but if you have this synthesis position on a significant enough topic, the people that are invested, their catalog is invested in the in a, thesis, the thesis and, right, right, and yeah. the conflict, they don't want a solution. Right. They're probably the last people right. that are going to buy your book. Right. And so that was shitty. Right. I was like, what is... <laughs> right. Right, well, because you're just wandering into that, and then you were like, oh, oh, really? Oh, wait, this is an established is catalog that oh. you're, you're all invested in this right. conflict, mm-hmm. and you don't want a solution. No, because the real thing, you're right, is like, that's the, well, and we'll probably get into it at some point, but that's the Coonian thing, right? Is that this is protection of a paradigm, and part of that protection is necessarily that conflict. Yeah. Like yeah. that conflict is part of the thing. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, and the, the defense of the paradigm. Let's spend, let's spend four minutes talking about Kuhn and I his love work. love Thomas. <laughs> of course. Let's do that. And, and maybe people aren't fully familiar with it. I mean, obviously we see it and we live it. Uh, but was it 1952? The History of Scientific Revolutions? Yeah. I think so. The structure. The structure. Sorry. Of scientific the structure of scientific revolutions. Yeah. And so... I'll address some of that in my orthodox critique as well, but on the short version, you know, you can tell us. Sure. Kuhn went back, studied the history of science, and identified and named, you know, what these things were: paradigm, paradigm shift. Yeah, if you've heard the term was. paradigm or paradigm shift, that's that's a Kuhn. Yeah, that's a Kuhn thing. I mean, it's a. Uh, yeah, what he did, and he he illustrates through the structure of scientific revolutions. Um, And he has anecdotal evidence that he cites about, you know, a heliocentric universe, uh, understanding of gravity, um, you know. And uh, so what he did was he found that there was this frame that you could use that's useful about understanding uh, an establishment of uh, science in particular was his chosen field. Although it's now become like just carpet bombed through every single place where there's any kind of a an orthodox understanding of something but like uh and this too maps on to right like luther's you know the theses yeah yeah 90 91 i i I was gonna say 99 but i don't know if it's 96 96 theses we're gonna have to like yeah get get some clarity on that and check the 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 show notes right um but yeah i mean that's where it is there was this um orthodox understanding and well what about these things you know um and you know without fail what he found is that toward the end of a paradigm um a a, a particular kind of understanding let's use something like gravity or the understanding of like you know newtonian gravity versus einsteinian gravity understand like those are two those they're using the same word to mean two very different things you know um now the outcomes look similar but they're actually measuring something that's very different and so to do the calculations, what he noticed is even toward the end of like Newtonian gravity calculations, they had to come up with all of these permutations of what was once a really beautiful, you know, set of physics, you know, sort of uh, uh, formulas for how do you measure gravity or something like this, something that simple. And they had to come up with something really elephantine just to keep protecting the paradigm. Um, so there was all of this like backlash and conflict and everything like that. And then before the paradigm is smashed and a new one comes in, this is the behavior. Mm-hmm. And so part of what you can, and what you do really well, uh, is like, well, here's all the signals that we're, we're in a mounting Cunian crisis vis-a-vis this question. Right. You know? Right. And you can see it, uh, on display. It's following that same sine wave, that same pattern. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's like, uh, and, and so, You know, I mean, this discussion is like entrenched and I'm not even sure that people know what it is. 
you know, mm -hmm. and, and or what are the qualifying criteria? Um, right. What what level of crisis? Right. You know, here we've got you know fifteen hundred competing hypotheses. That's a characteristic. Right. Um, you know, we want to we want to we want to you know uh, proclaim the who and the when and the what and the why, but we have no sufficient and thorough how. Right. Well, this this is all backwards. Right. And uh, so you know, there's a lot of lunacy going on in this whole debate. But it's like, how do you even slow this down right. to talk about it? Right. And so I think the Kuhn's analysis is, is one of the vehicles that we're going to do that with. So Yeah. Okay. Now we have to wrap. Like, yeah. We're wrapping on Kuhn. It was great. <laughs> Thank you. I love you. I love you too, and, man. Thank uh, you for having me on. This was super awesome. Yeah. I hope you still can be my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and let me get you on camera. Maybe, okay. maybe you can write the... Uh, the uh, what is it at the beginning of the book? Preface? Yeah, or the uh, forward. The forward. No, no, no. I'll write the preface. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you'll write the preface. What do you think about that? That's fine. Or the uh, forward. I'll write a forward. You'll write a Absolutely. forward. Absolutely. Okay, cool. You're on the yeah, hook. Right on. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Stay tuned. We'll see you soon. More conversations with Jeremy. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, brother. All right. Yeah. All right. To know who we are, where we are, and where we're going, we must know how we arrived here. Welcome to Rephetic, a revolutionary study of the Great Pyramid, which promises to rewrite civilization's history.